Hello, and welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series. Episodes are available on VHHA.com and on popular podcast hosting apps, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, and many others. We're a member of the Public Health Podcast Network, the Virginia Audio Collective, and the Family Podcast Network. Episodes also air each Saturday at noon and Sundays at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, and 8.20 a.m. across Central Virginia, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send us any questions, comments, feedback, or guest suggestions to pcfpodcast at vhha.com. Again, that's pcfpodcast at vhha.com. I'm Will, your host, and today we are very excited to be joined by Dr. Greg Hunley, who is the director of the Poly Heart Center at VCU Health. We'll cover his career, the work of the Poly Heart Center, and a little bit more. But before all that, Dr. Hunley, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, we appreciate you taking a little bit of time to speak with us. Before we dive into our main conversation for today, I'd love for you to just share a little bit of your background with us. I know you're a native Richmonder like myself, which is great. I think you attended William & Mary for undergrad before VCU Medical School and then a residency and fellowship in cardiology at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. So you've been kind of all over the country, which is cool. But one thing that stuck out to me is I believe you came back to VCU from the Wake Forest School of Medicine. Is that right? What was your experience like there? and How long were you there? Yeah, thanks so much, Will. Basically, my training program, you know, for for your listeners, you go through medical school and then you do residency. And for a cardiovascular medicine physician, or I guess traditionally called cardiologist, uh, you do a fellowship program. So my residency and fellowship were in Dallas, Texas at Parkland Hospital, uh, where they took uh, John Kennedy uh, after he had uh, suffered that uh, shooting. And then Uh, I was also a faculty member there. You know, you mentioned Richmond. Uh, We wanted our children, my wife and I, to know their grandparents, and so we ended up moving a little bit closer, and we're at Wake Forest for 22 years, Uh, and there worked in the field of cardiovascular imaging, incorporating magnetic resonance imaging to help us understand the disease processes that affect the cardiovascular system, and then five years ago, moved from Wake Forest back to Richmond at VCU and VCU Health to direct the Pauley Heart Center as a component of our health system here. So like you mentioned, you make your journey back up to Richmond from Winston-Salem to become the first director of the Pauley Heart Center in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. As a native Richmonder, someone who went to VCU medical school, that must have been a proud moment for you, right? What was that like? Absolutely, Will. You know, just the the strong community engagement here with the university, VCU, and then also the tremendous history that VCU Health has in the area of heart disease. I I don't know if many of your listeners are aware, but the VCU Medical Center was really a formative area in cardiac transplantation uh, with Dr. Richard Lauer back in the 1960s really formulated the group that then went on to bring cardiac transplantation to the forefront of of medical therapy. And so as a consequence, I think, you know, when we think of VCU Health and what it does, it's really the flagship for the state for those patients that have very serious illness. You know, certainly we hear a lot about the expertise on the surgical side uh, with trauma on the cardiovascular side, just a leader in terms of advanced heart failure care, cardiac transplantation, implanting of left ventricular assist devices, electrophysiology is a strength. So for patients with arrhythmias, trying to manage those, whether it be implantation of pacemakers or devices or also ablation therapies where we cure the patient of the heart rhythm. We are a leader in interventional cardiology where we go and place stents to open up blocked arteries, but also implant heart valves that need to be replaced using percutaneous procedures. I think what's been exciting over the last five years, in addition to the procedural care, are some of the non-procedural related specialties that we have here at the Heart Center. Those include cardio-oncology, so working together with our Massey Cancer colleagues, 
what is cardio-oncology, but treating heart disease as a result of the cancer treatments. And those are very important, for example, in women with breast cancer, men with prostate cancer. Other areas include preventive cardiology, where, you know, cardiovascular disease kills one in two people on earth, you know, just on the planet. And so coming up with ways to prevent heart attacks, to prevent strokes, to prevent the development of heart failure, that's an area where we're growing. Another area is what we call adult congenital heart disease. And what is that? Congenital heart disease, as we remember from our biology class, four chambers of the heart are present in mammals. Some individuals are born with three chambers. Also, the blood circulates throughout the body through specific channels, and sometimes those arteries and veins are switched and blood flow is incorrect. And so at the time of birth, many of those infants will have surgical procedures, and as we grow over time and age, many more procedures need to be performed to accommodate the growth of the individual. Well, today, many of these individuals live into adulthood, and so special care is needed uh, in that arena. We're also a center of excellence for conditions like sarcoidosis. That's an inflammatory condition of the heart. Things like cardiac amyloid, an infiltrative protein that sometimes present with aging, but also other conditions that are genetic related that infiltrates the heart. We treat folks in, in those areas as well. So the cardiovascular offerings here at VCU Health with the Pauley Heart Center are really span all of cardiovascular medicine. And what attracted me to come here was to help be a part of that. And my area, as we've talked about, is imaging. Well, imaging really benefits all of those areas, whether it's interventional procedures, who needs the intervention, placement of a heart valve, an opening of an artery, a site of ablation for an arrhythmia, but also these non-interventional subspecialties so that we can guide the appropriate delivery of the medical therapy. And again, in addition to the clinical practice, it's also the research and education initiatives in those areas which we help foster. Well, that is quite comprehensive, I must say. It sounds like you all sort of offer the whole array of, of treatment. I want to drill down a little bit on one of the new initiatives that I believe you all are involved in, for reference, we're recording this on February 29th, so as American Heart Month comes to a close. One of the initiatives that I've read about is related a little bit to staffing shortages. And as many people will know at this point, there are fairly pervasive staffing shortages across a lot of industries, to be honest, but healthcare has been particularly impacted by that. So one of the things that y'all have done is created a partnership with the Virginia Community College System to start cardiac sonographer programs across the state. So I wonder if you could talk about that initiative a little bit, maybe share some of the few important details about it, but also some important details about cardiac sonography in general for those who may be unaware. Right. Thanks so much, Will. So, you know, this this does get to imaging. And for our listeners, if a patient presents with a symptom complex that would suggest a cardiac problem, so for example, you're walking and you develop shortness of breath, you're walking and we see the commercials on TV and develop chest pain, then what we need to do often first is take an image of the heart. And the way we do that as the first test in the line of imaging is go to ultrasound testing. And for the cardiac system or the heart, we call that echocardiography. In general, for sound wave testing, we talk about that as sonography, so we might also call it cardiac sonography. And that test is very nice. The machine, uh, some of the machines today are portable. Other machines we wheel around on carts, but we use sound waves and their reflections of those waves to image the heart and the blood vessels surrounding the heart. So it's kind of a first-line test. Well, the machine does some of the work. But the majority of the work is done by the operator of the machine, and we call those individuals cardiac sonographers. And today, 
the echocardiogram or the cardiac sonographer test is one of the foremost in not only cardiovascular medicine, but also let's think about sometimes patients need a surgery procedure. Well, we want to check out the heart and make sure it's okay to withstand the surgery. If we have a patient that has high blood pressure and needs medical therapy for that, we want to make sure the high blood pressure hasn't damaged the heart. So you can start to see that in addition to someone seeing a cardiologist that might need an echocardiogram, people that see surgeons might need a patient referred for an echocardiogram. Patients that see internists or family practice doctors might need an echocardiogram. So the test is widely ordered and widely used. It's relatively safe. It uses ultrasound, so it doesn't use x-rays or ionizing radiation. It's very prevalent. Well, nationwide, we have a marked shortage of the cardiac sonographers, those individuals that operate the echo machines. And so to address that shortage, we started to think about how to train a group of individuals. Well, what are the requirements to be a cardiac sonographer? Well, there are two pathways. One is to go to a four-year college and have a special degree in this. And many people that go to the four-year college for that type of degree want to also have an application in administration. So if we look at all the cardiac sonographers, that not necessarily is the most common pathway. The most common pathway is right out of high school to do a two-year training program. And in the state of Virginia, the two-year training programs are offered through our community college system. And so three or four years ago, we had this idea, and with the help of Delegate Hodges and other legislators, Senator McDougal, we were able to arrange for funding to start a cardiac sonographer training program with Rappahannock Community College. And for those of you in the Richmond area, where are those campuses for Rappahannock Community College? One is over toward Gloucester County in Glens. It's very near Saluda. If you go to the Urbana Oyster Festival, you'll pass it on the way going there. And then the other campus is in Warsaw, Virginia, which is right across the Rappahannock River from Tappahannock. So those two campuses where individuals from high school are recruited to go for one year of didactic training at the community college system and then experiential training that's hands-on, you're working in hospitals and things like that in the second year in hospitals that are co-located in that geographic area, but also here in Richmond at VCU Health. And the point is to build up the cardiac sonographer training program so that we can address the staffing shortage both within our state but also even contribute nationwide. So we're very grateful to the state legislature. We're very grateful to the community college system for launching this. And also the first class is coming through where we have eight, and I believe next year the second class is going to be 12. And For those of you interested in becoming a cardiac sonographer, the pay starts at about $75,000 or so a year and has a lot of upward mobility to north of $100,000 a year as you move and progress and become more experienced. There are different disciplines in cardiac sonography. Some uh, of the trained sonographers like to work with children. And so they work in the pediatric area. Some like to work with adults. They work in the adult area. Some like to work with neonates. So for children still in the womb of the mother, there's training programs there. Some want to be focused more on the blood vessels. And so they do vascular sonography, which all fits kind of in the same area. So it's a nice broad-based program, and trainees work in the areas that they want to become involved with later on in their careers. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm sure it took a fair amount of work and time to get that program off the ground, but it sounds like it's been successful already and will continue to do so. So thanks for sharing that. And for those interested, certainly encourage you to check out more information online to find out more about that career path, which is great. Dr. Hundley, I want to, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I did want to give you the opportunity. I, we were talking before we 
hit record here about a podcast that you host. And so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to share briefly a little bit of information about that uh, for folks who might want to hear more from you. Well, thanks so much, Will. So listeners, what Will is referring to is uh, we have a podcast weekly, Circulation on the Run. It's in collaboration with the American Heart Association. And the American Heart Association publishes a series of journals that focus on the research that those journals publish. And each week we interview an author, Dr. Petter Myrie from Europe and others. We interview authors of these articles and sort of try to bring the research to the forefront. And we also discuss some of the other important publications of the week. And so Circulation on the Run is what it's called. It's released every Tuesday and uh, I'd love to have uh, any of our listeners join. It's a little bit on the sciencey side. And so it, it, it focuses a lot on the research initiatives. But thanks so much, Will, for uh, letting us uh, share that important point. Yeah, that's cool. Well, that I'll I'll have to add that to my list, and certainly encourage other folks to listen as well. My my wife, as re- return listeners will know, is a nurse. She used to work on a cardiac ICU, so I'll, so I'll definitely pass that on to her. She might be interested as well. Before we let you go, we have a tradition on this podcast to ask our guests a pair of sort of timeless classic questions to close things out in kind of a fun way. So I have a list of 10 mystery questions that we'll draw from. When you're ready, if you give me two numbers between one and 10, I'll read you those corresponding questions to close us out. Three and seven. Okay, number three. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received and why does it stick with you? Oh, wow. Uh, (laughs) I think really honesty and being genuine, you receive that from your parents and uh, just try to hold that forth. Um, great question. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and then number seven to finish us off. And this is a, a timeless classic. If you could choose one superpower to have or any one skill to instantly master, what would it be and why? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> Will? <laughs> They're not easy. <laughs> you, 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 these are tough questions. You got a whole, a whole world of answers to choose from. Oh, gosh. I, I have no idea. Uh, superpower. You know, my family always asks me these questions, and I always go, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm kind of, uh, you know, it's what you need for, I, I don't know. For any particular I would say day. compassion. Compassion. And just being uh, empathetic. Uh, and 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 seeking an ability in that compassion, it's how do you be empathetic? It's to be a great listener, hmm. and I, I think that would be something uh, just to keep and and go forward. Because if you're a great listener, then you can help be a contributor to solving issues moving forward and create a positive environment. So I, I think I'd I'd probably list that. I like that. From a timeless question, we get some timeless wisdom. That is great. Well, those are, those are two fantastic answers. And with that, we have come to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you liked what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so you know when new episodes are released. We want to once again thank our guest, Dr. Greg Hunley, for joining us today. So, Dr. Hunley, seriously, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, and thank you, Will. And thanks, listeners. <laughs>